So thank you everyone and welcome back again after, after the last coffee break. We have the last session and we are together with uh, Richard Bosch from Actual and uh, yeah, he's going to talk about how to survive managing StreamZ in an enterprise. So it's to you, Richard. Thank you, thank you, Paolo. So uh, thanks for joining me. Last talk of the StreamZCon. Um, I hope you've enjoyed it so far. I know I did. So I'm Richard Bosch. I'm the developer advocate at Actual, and I'm here to talk about surviving uh, managing strips in an enterprise. So why do I say that in an enterprise? I work for Actual, and we build and maintain the Actual platform, which is, uh, amongst other things, a cloud service or your own uh, platform based on StreamZ. Um, before I did this, uh, I was also uh, doing uh, implementation. So I was focusing on embedded systems, the ESB, worked a lot with integration systems. Um, of course, there's also some play. I uh, also just go around taking pictures, love air shows. So for me, it is just uh, fun to have technology and uh, well, basically anything surrounding technology and doing something with photography. So let's talk about stream managing stream scene and enterprise. Uh, the enterprise we're talking about is a bank in uh, the Netherlands. And in 2015, they decided they wanted to go to a 100% digital bank and become a real-time business. Um, they started designing, uh, analyzing their systems, and they came up with a product or a service called the Business Event Bus, where uh, a solution where things that happen can be captured from anywhere and delivered to anywhere for processing. Uh, it relied on consumers and producers not knowing about each other and uh, being generally available within the enterprise. It says here, business event bus. Uh, the focus here was on business events, uh, so organizational events, and not, not just technical events like you often also see with Kafka. So what did they envision? Well... The first use cases were based on transaction processing and, for example, alerting. If you've got, an, you can set up an alert for your mobile phone, you get a text message that the money was transferred or uh, your uh, balance is getting too low. In, uh, in the previous implementations, the delays went up to 15 minutes sometimes. That needed to be improved. But they already envisioned if this is an successful uh, implementation, we have more use cases. Um, as you can see, these are quite a list and they have just started growing and growing. Uh, needless to say, I'm still here with actual, those use cases were a success and basically they are all now implemented. So when I'm talking about an enterprise, we usually go into business style stakeholders, data owners, uh, who wants to say, I, I'm responsible for a certain type of data. I want to be in control. Architects that want to have a stable, ready-to-go platform. Uh, developers want, of course, develop. They want to be uh, not be limited by processes or by tools. They just want to develop, deploy, run. Then we have operators that want, of course, predictability, maintain, uh, maintainable systems. And often you work with procurement because they want to have vendors that the organization can rely on. So at the first, only a couple of these were relevant. Uh, procurement was not that re uh, relevant at that stage. But uh, the data ownership and uh, the, uh, the future-proof platform was very important. So we came up with some initial requirements and challenges. Um, for our deployment, we wanted TLS communications, encryption. Uh, it needed to be high available uh, in multiple uh, uh, data centers. Data needed to be replicated. They wanted to use TLS client authentication and uh, authorization was required for all activities. 
This is 2015, Kafka is at 0 0.9, and StreamC isn't even there yet. So the TLS was just introduced. We uh, Mirror Maker was there, but was also limited. Um, stretching a cost across data centers is technically possible, but a challenge as well. And setting up and maintaining uh, the access control, well, that was all manual work. And then we move to the management part. Um, the, and I mean with management, the operations, the, the, the definitions of data. So they only wanted AFO schema support. Uh, there was a single support operations team. Uh, the access control was uh, controlled. Uh, the access control was very strict. So they wanted separation of roles uh, to uh, control access to topics and applications. And most of all, the business is responsible. So they should be able to approve access uh, to a topic. So what are the challenges here? Well, we need schema libraries. We need to maintain registrations and uh, uh, the onboarding business clients and coordinating all those access requests. So let's start with the implementation first. We decided on two clusters. Don't go with stretched because there was too much issues with latencies. We have a transaction system and a notification system, and they will be producing a tool on one of the data centers. But there was a requirement for high availability and failover. So that means that there needed to be a second data center, and that means data synchronization. So we set this up. We built our own uh, connectors to optimize the data synchronization according to our requirements. We uh, set up the processes, the initial, the first processes for uh, onboarding. So, what, what's the, what was our job in operations? Well, we monitor everything of the usage. We add uh, topics. We update access controls. We onboard teams, developers, business owners, and uh, maintain the libraries. And, uh, in the meantime, we also did technical collection of data to make sure that everything was up and running, which is quite a lot for a single team. This was a typical day. Someone comes by and I want to, uh, to publish an event. What should I do? Uh, someone else is saying, well, um, someone wanted to consume. Are they actually allowed to consume? And then five other people come by with uh, other questions. So a typical flow in this case, scenario 2015, was the developer needs access. Okay, sure, I'll tell them it's uh, going to be needed. Uh, we need permissions, I'll ask them. So I asked the owner if they accept, and they said, well, I have no idea why they want to do this. Um, I'll talk to them and get back to you. Sometimes a couple of days, sometimes a couple of weeks later, yes. Well, nice. Now I can finally continue while keeping track of my paperwork. Schema updates. I've written down the process. I'm not going to through it, go through it, but basically it's Git-based. Uh, it's a project that needs to be built and released. And we were the only ones that are approving uh, the, ch the changes to it. So how did we do that? Prompts. Command line scripts everywhere. We created scripts for deploying our components, Kafka, Zookeeper, uh, Kafka Connect. Then we had uh, configuration scripts to tell them how to be deployed. Then after they were deployed, we had scripts for creation of the things inside the, the, uh, the clusters. Um, we had scripts about scripts about scripts. It's a headache. So scripts, all these access, uh, all these requests, how do you survive this in an enterprise? Well, the answer is actually simple. You delegate, you reassign responsibilities. What I don't want to do is be a bottleneck for others. So everything that they can do themselves, they should be doing. 
So we decided on a self-service approach where we had two groups, topic owners and application owners. And the topic owners define topics, the sizing, they approve access, uh, they, def they decide what the schema definitions are, um, and they can are allowed to get contact information for, uh, for application owners. The application owner can register the application and credentials. They request access to topics and they can get uh, the contact information for topic owners, which means I'm no longer in the middle. This helps you survive, of course. But it also introduces new challenges. Um, we'll get to that later on on our Kafka operations and st where StreamC comes in. So we finally removed all those scripts and we can focus on operations, maintenance, onboarding and support. So quick overview. This is what we created, a topic overview, uh, topic data information, application information, But it's a success. We're an enterprise. The stakeholders are back. Some of them were ignored long enough where they say it's now success. Our requirements need to be taken into account. So we had some new requirements also for ourselves because we were going public with this solution. So we wanted it to run on Kubernetes. It should be multi-tenant uh, where each tenant can define their own topics, their own environments with the same names as another tenant without having fear of collisions. Tenants should not be able to even see or use each other's topics, uh, both in Kafka or in self-service. And uh, there should be secured public endpoints so that they could connect to it. All straight, very straightforward. So again, how do we survive these new requirements? In this case, we started by introducing StreamZ. Well, we moved to the cloud for our solutions, VM-based de deployments. It's not a problem, but um, Kubernetes uh, was the future, and it's still very easy to deploy and maintain uh, your infrastructure that way. So we moved to the cloud. We want to become Kubernetes native, and StreamZ is open source, has a very active community. But also very important, it's extendable and configurable. They have their own way of doing things, but give you the option to do it your own way. If you need different, if you have different requirements, you are mostly capable of setting uh, using that. So, where did uh, StreamC come in on the, these challenges, and what were those challenges? So, at first, we had the multi-tenancy. Um, we need the authentication support, uh, authorization, of course, and it needed to be very secure. So if I have multiple tenants on a cluster, I want to use naming patterns for resources. There were actually several presentations on, uh, before now on multi-tenancy uh, or uh, partial multi-tenancy that uses the same approach. Uh, and you want to use those patterns for the predictable resources. Environment, it's the same thing. You can use the environment name in your patterns. And then prevent visibility and access across environments. This was a bit harder because that means we needed to set strict ACLs. You basically want to deny everything unless you allow it. Uh, Kafka supports it, StreamC supports this, but we are multi-tenant and these tenants are not even from the same company uh, sometimes. So we needed to prevent the same principal names be generated by accident. Um, for example, if you use SSL by default, it uses your distinguished name. CN is uh, my user. Um, but if another, com another company uses that same name, then they might get access to the topics of the other tenant, which is, of course, not allowed. Um, so what was our solution? We enforce everything in self-service. We create unique social credentials. We uh, can specify certificate authorities and include it in the principal names. 
and uh, we specify which certificate authorities are allowed for certain environments tenants. So it gets a bit and look like this. Uh, you have your deployments. The red, the yellow, and the green uh, descriptions are the different tenants. They have multiple environments, and as you can see, sometimes they have the same name, like prod. Um, we collect them inside what we call an instance, uh, which is a group of environments that need to be deployed on one or more cluster. And then we basically deploy them with that pattern, uh, with those pattern names and the ACLs, and enable replication between the clusters for those topics. Um, so where stream C multi-tenancy is a bit harder because of the requirements we just had, especially the SSL TLS, um, we don't use the, the user or topic operators. Uh, the user operator creates for SSL TLS uh, their simple formats of names and not the advanced one that we want to use with the uh, certificate authority as part of the principal name. And also, uh, we don't didn't want any dependency or wait for resources to be created from our self-service point of view, which is, of course, well, you can just debate that. Uh, for us, it was uh, what we decided on. To allow this in StreamC, we set an explicit super user, and we connect you to uh, the cluster using the Kafka admin APIs. It means that we always can read the current state and apply changes. Because of our new SSL and uh, requirement, we also needed to update uh, the Kafka images from StreamC, which they allow. We added our own principal builder, configured StreamC to use that principal builder. Uh, and now it will add the certificate authority to the principal name. So StreamC, by its flexibility and its uh, extendability allowed us to do this relatively simple. So what did we achieve? Well, we're now running on Kubernetes. We uh, have a cluster that can support topics for separate tenants. There can be, uh, they can reuse names and environment names because of the naming patterns. And they cannot uh, see each other's topics because we generate all credentials and principal names and are in control that they are unique per tenant and, uh, and across tenants. Well, what have we not done yet? Well, we've not even touched the endpoints yet. So our second challenge with setting up uh, the, this uh, StreamC and Kubernetes deployment is the external connections. We are running in a cloud. Um, we own the cloud machines, but our customers are anywhere on the internet or have their own connections uh, outside of Kubernetes. So how do we make sure that they are reliable and accessible to the, the Kafka is accessible to those customers? So first, we provide static public endpoints. We arrange IP addresses. We arrange the DNS entries, public ones uh, for those uh, that match those addresses. This means that now you can set up firewall rules or routing rules uh, in your company networks. Of course, you need to set up external listeners explicitly for SSL and TLS and, uh, or for SASL. And you need to use these public names as your advertised listener. Well, Kafka supports all of this out of the box. Um, so how do we get that uh, in StreamC? Well, after we uh, need to secure the endpoints, we use TLS, of course, and the certificate certif uh, with uh, the subject alternative name for our URLs, of course. Sorry. So when you configure StreamC, you can set up your own listeners. You can set per broker 
what kind of uh, you can set up a listener type and then per broker you can specify host names you can uh, spe uh, specify uh, what kind of connection it is SASL or uh, TLS encrypted or TLS authentication so the first one we use is internal one because when we uh, communicate between our own systems we don't want to go outside of our cloud and have extra traffic costs. And you can use network policy peers to limit access to those, in, uh, to those uh, uh, internal listeners. But for the external ones, we specify load balancers or ingress, which allows us to specify the host name or IP address per broker. And uh, we can generate certificates with, this, uh, with those names uh, accordingly, we turn on uh, the authentication and the authorization with uh, SASL and the client certificate. So now in StreamZ, we can set up all of these and we can basically start. The end result would be we have a uh, Kubernetes cluster now running, which can be used internally uh, from your own apps and uh, externally for customer apps. So did we uh, have some more requirements met now? Well, yeah, basically our public endpoints are now reachable. Each of our broker has its own endpoint and a certificate signed with the relevant uh, host, uh, signed by the CA and with the relevant host name in the some list of the certificate. Uh, when you connect to StreamC, it will uh, offer that. And when the advertised host, the next part of the communication uh, will use those public addresses. Now we have one final, and this is a big challenge, but thankfully something that Kubernetes was made for, it's about resource usage to get inside and uh, to try to optimize it. So what are the challenges we have for resources? Well, we have uh, the node sizes. We have in Kubernetes, of course, different nodes. And we assign uh, that there are uh, pods being scheduled to use those nodes. But how do we make sure that the right nodes are used for our Kafka, which needs a lot of CPU, a lot of memory. Um, also, how we make sure that other applications are not using that, for example. So that these are things that are quite common, but how do we do that with StreamC? Well, we had to find out. We also want to monitor, of course, this resource uh, usage and alerts when we reach those limits and in the end of course optimize the configuration so let's start with the sizing we generally we created dedicated nodes for kafka um, like i said kafka is uh, pretty high has pretty high standards for uh, their vm for the cpu their um, memory usage and their disk usage so you often want to use dedicated nodes uh, to make sure that it can meet those performance requirements. Then we need to mark those nodes with some way to indicate what their sizing is or where they're, what they're supposed to be used for. And then we use the concept of affinity and anti-affinity to select the node for the proper size and usage and to make sure that others uh, uh, pods are not allocated there. So what does it look like? We've done a bit of sizing here. We have our Kubernetes and we have a bunch of nodes running. The D1 are dedicated ones and they are dedicated in this case for Kafka. We gave them some uh, uh, labels and you can use uh, different ways of identifying them. But now you have a label that it says, this is dedicated for Kafka and it's in uh, zone Z1, Z2, Z3. Then we have nodes C, which are, as you can see, smaller in size. 
and they are the default ones so we have uh, we can use those for uh, the basically our components that do not require dedicated hardware and that can be anything from schema registries to uh, uh, certificate managers and uh, other uh, utilities so what offers uh, what does uh, streamc offer well it has two features uh, that it offers for deploying uh, the resources. One of them is uh, uh, the REC awareness, which is mostly used for partitioning and making sure that uh, you can have multiple RECs. And if you have a, part a partition and replicas, it will spread the replicas as, as much as possible to different RECs. If one of the RECs fails or, or availability zones in clouds, it will continue to work because one of the replicas will take over. There's also the affinity and anti-affinity rules, which they made possible to configure. So the, end, the affinity rules can be used to say, I want to use a node which has the label uh, dedicated and the value Kafka. And then I can use a different rule to say, you should not deploy this if there is already one deployed. Or um, there should be uh, uh, no system named X running here. The, these two rules, which are basic uh, Kubernetes, are sometimes hard to set up to, to tweak right, but make sure that you have uh, you don't reuse your resources unless you absolutely want to. Uh, and you also don't get into trouble that if you reuse the same node, um, and let's say the load goes up, then both then the load goes up twice for both brokers maybe, um, killing your node. So we set it up that brokers do not share a node. Then we go into the uh, monitoring which again, you collect metrics from uh, Kubernetes, from applications, from Kafka, you visualize them. And again, StreamC offers everything already. You can export your metrics, you can export extra additional Kafka metrics with the Kafka exporter. You can en enable scanning with the pod monitor so that Prometheus and Grafana can uh, discover them. And uh, we also enable node monitoring so we can see what each node is doing. And we add some dashboards based on the uh, streams. She also offers a lot of those. So this is for uh, one of our clusters. You can see different loads. So the, the Kafka exporter data. Um, go to check about time. Um, well, alerting is uh, uh, important, of course, but before you can set up alerts, you need to know what normal is. So always track your CPU, your memory, disk usage for your nodes, your pods, and uh, use your alert manager and your uh, to and these metrics to determine the values, the triggers for your alerts. Um, use Kafka defined alerts. There are uh, lots of documentation about what the metrics mean, what you need to monitor, where you should put an immediate alarm on, what you shouldn't. And then I'm thinking about under-replicated partitions, offline partitions, the sort. So StreamC supposed the metrics collection for all of these things. Uh, and if you deploy the alert manager with uh, Prometheus, you get those warnings. Uh, you can set up alert rules as well. You can monitor, you can update them in Kubernetes, maintain them, and then you can have call outs, uh, that sort of thing. Highly recommend it for highly available systems to uh, do this. An example of some of the rules, these are based on the nodes uh, performance. And then when you optimize, you track CPU memory and disk usage you, uh, again, use these uh, values and you start optimizing it. 
What's important to track? Um, CPU memory usage, we often over provision, then realize we use memory or we use CPU, we assign it, but we never use it. Or the other way around, it's getting critical or it's reaching a boundary, we might want to give them more margin. Especially important to track here is the file system for Kafka because it's very heavy on the file system and too many files can break your Kafka deployment, your broker. Um, so the number of partitions and the segment rules will determine how many files you have. Too many files and Kafka won't start anymore. We've had this a couple of times, um, very hard to recover from, try to prevent this, monitor your files. And very important, use cruise control to redistribute your replicas uh, to even your load. During production and scaling up, you will encounter imbalances. So now we can optimize our resources again with StreamZ. We have basically all our new requirements met. So the business event bus is currently still active. We now have 565 topics in production, 18, over 1,800 topics uh, for development, and 350 applications uh, uh, active. Well, reducing our maintenance team from uh, six persons to a half FTE in 2021. So that's quite a way to optimize it. We survived. And even be better, the business event bus is just one of the tenants sharing that single cluster. So it has 16 brokers, uh, 2,700 partitions, 10 terabytes of storage in use, and 1,100 consumer groups. This is how we have survived with the help of Strimzy uh, to scale up like this. Are there any questions? I think we're almost out of time already. So there are no questions. Uh, we still have 10 minutes. So if you want to move forward, you can. Um, what do you mean, Paul, to move forward? Oh, I mean, so the, that's the end of the session. So it's fine. No, yeah. no, I was just saying if the, you have any something more to show, there are no questions right now. Yeah. So, if you, I know this is a lot of text, a lot of things to do. If you want to have more information, just contact me. I'm on LinkedIn. Uh, I'm also on Reddit active uh, with asking uh, with questions and on different mailing lists. Um, we're happy to have a chat with you about your insights, my insights, not just from the sales point of view, but also just as a technical guy loving Stream C and what they offer us. So we actually have got a question for you, uh, Richard. So Moritz is asking, are you using the CSI for local files provided by your cloud provider or local disks for the dedicated Kafka nodes? Um, what we're currently using, I'm not really sure of. Uh, I think we're still using we're using the C, uh, the CSI, um, but we have set done setups with both, uh, where of course the local disks for the dedicated Kafka nodes uh, have a higher performance, but are also, in our experience, I think a bit harder to set up. Thank you. <clears throat> So any more questions from the audience? We still have five minutes or we can wrap up here and thank Richard for the session. You're welcome. I'm glad to have joined you and uh, I hope you've all enjoyed StreamCon as much as I have. <laughs> yeah, sure. Thank you very much, Richard. It was a great session and thank you for sharing our actual this using StreamZ underneath your platform. <laughs> You're welcome.